Hey everyone, before we get started, we wanted to make an announcement to let you know that we have recorded this episode on Sunday prior to the PGA Tour and Live Tour announcing that they are merging together. While details are still forthcoming, we're releasing this episode as we would have when we recorded on Sunday. Enjoy! What's up, Drop Pod listeners? As always, you can listen to the Drop Podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Google Pods. We're now on Apple Music, Audible, and Pandora as well. New episodes drop every Wednesday. You can find all of our content on YouTube at The Drop Golf Podcast and on our socials. That's Instagram and Twitter at The Drop underscore pod. No matter how you consume us, like, subscribe, rate, review, all that good stuff, follow and listen along. This episode is sponsored by the Law Office of Mallon and Tranger. Tom Mallon and Randy Tranger are board-certified trial attorneys who share more than 40 years of legal experience. They specialize in personal injury matters, workers' compensation cases, and criminal and municipal defense. As certified trial attorneys, they have recovered millions of dollars on behalf of people injured in accidents and employees injured at work. They have offices conveniently located in Freehold and Point Pleasant. For skilled and personalized legal representation, call Mallon and Tranger at 732 780 0230 or check out their website at tmallonlaw.com. Not only are they good people, they're good golfers too. This is the Drop Podcast where we talk golfing in the Garden State. I'm Mike Poro and this is Ryan Kulat. What is up everyone? Hope you guys had a great week. We got another really cool episode coming at you. We got an opportunity to go down to Seaview Golf Club, played the course. We're going to talk about that. We interviewed the head pro there, Jeff Carswell. And if you don't know why that's important, this week, Seaview is hosting the ShopRite Cup Classic. And that's a, that's a major LPGA tour stop. They've been there for a number of years so that's coming up this week. This episode's coming out on Wednesday. They're teeing it up Friday, Saturday, Sunday there. So really cool. We got to play the course. We're going to talk about it. And then the back half of this is going to be our interview with Jeff. And unfortunately, we weren't able to interview Jeff on property, uh, which is what we were we were hoping for. But some things came up. And so he jumped on, jumped on Zoom with us for a little bit. And great to have him on. So, um, so that's what we got coming up here. But before we get into all that... We want to remind everyone that we're selling limited edition, the Drop Podcast polos. You can pre-order them at flukeapparelco.com. Choose from any of the three designs listed on their website. With each polo purchase, we're donating $5 to the Jersey Shore First Tee Program. Go order a great polo for an even better cause. You don't want to miss this exclusive offer. It won't last forever. Yeah, I mean, listen, let's talk a little bit about the polos real quick, because I know a lot of the audience members have been asking and DM and emailing us like, hey, do, when do you think they're going to come in? And, and I, from my understanding, fingers crossed, they'll be in your mailboxes by Father's Day, which is June 18th. Um, so fingers crossed that happens. You know, we've been talking with Chris over at Fluke Apparel Company about, you know, a, a definitive date, you know, and I think as a pre-ordering goes, if you're not a hundred percent familiar with that is, you know, we got to kind of make sure that we can prove that we can push out some merch. And the reality is you as the audience and everybody else has, you know, click the button to, to go purchase one has done it to prove that to everybody. Um, so I greatly appreciate that. And if you haven't, I don't know what, what you're waiting on. Um, because like I've been saying over and over again, it is top quality gear that you will not be disappointed with. Uh, yeah, for sure. I, I do think in some of the texts that I got, Mike, I, I don't think that people, some people truly understood the, the pre-order process. You know, if 10 people ordered them, you know, it might not be worth to get them printed. But once we get to that X number, then, it's, then they're going to get uh, processed and whatnot. So it, it has, for some people not understanding that process, it's been longer than than they've hoped or wanted or or what have you but we're full go and and now like i said we're expecting them before uh father's day so if you haven't haven't ordered one or or did order one for father's day you should you should be feeling like yeah we're gonna get it for father's day so that's that's kind of our our timeline here so mike let's let's get into let's get into the Shoprite cup let's get into seaview 
Mike and I went down, uh, got to play Seaview. Jeff uh, was nice enough to, to block us. The last tee time available before they cut off the course. What will happen when a course has hosting a tournament, they'll decide X amount of days before that they'll stop play so they can let the golf course heal, basically, and finish up their maintenance without anyone you know, making divots on it or, or pitch marks or anything like that. So, so we went down there. We got that last time and had nobody behind us. Uh, nothing but foursomes in front of us, but it allowed us to kind of take our time and absorb the whole golf course, really. And for me, on the front nine especially, to see the whole golf course, because uh, I didn't see much of the fairways or greens, but I did get to see a lot of the bunkers and and waste areas, especially on the front. And uh, it was a really cool experience. They had a lot of the, a lot of the holes had at least most of the structures up so in some of the videos that we were able to take you're going to see that the 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 grandstands are up you know walking into the first hole like like we walked through the the archway that they have there and they have grandstands on the left and the right so you're you're really in like this tunnel of sorts for the first tee so it was it was really really cool uh, and then coming down 17 and 18, they got huge grandstands there, which was really cool. And then even seeing, like, as, as we were coming down, like, the, seeing the maintenance guys and how hard they were working, raking the bunkers and, and making sure that there was sand in spots. Like, we both played 17, and we'll put that video out and, and tease it a little bit for you. You'll have to see how we did. But, like, the maintenance guys are, while we're on the green, they're, they're raking the bunkers. They're going through the through the fescue, picking up golf balls. They're filling in divots that, you know, it was kind of cool to see that whole production of them doing that kind of stuff, finishing up the camera towers and things like that. Just really, really cool to see, you know, kind of like a behind the scenes view of it. It was really, really a, a lot of fun. And the course was in, in great shape. I, I know Mike and I talked quite a bit out there about the greens. Now, if you don't know anything about Seaview, it's very short. I, I think it plays 63. 100 is where it, it tips out at, but we didn't play it at 63. It was, it was even a little shorter than that because they didn't have us all the way back. But it's the greens that are the protection to that course. And even in our interview, you're going to hear Jeff talk about that as well. And I, I don't... Uh, the greens were super, super hard. Uh, uh, it really was, and, and Jeff says this as well, it's a second shot golf course. You know, keep your drive in the fairway and... and and then it's the second shot that it really needs to be dialed in. And I know that was that was for us a little frustrating. Like we felt like we hit good golf shots, but not being able to spin it like the professionals or, or hold the greens was was getting frustrating at points. And and Mike, I know for you more so than me, just because I, I couldn't even hit the greens. But that was that was the biggest that's the biggest defense there and, and to that golf course. Yeah, I mean, listen, I think. You know, before I, 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 before we, you know, I keep going, we go on a little bit about this. I, I, I'll press the pause button real quick. And, you know, obviously, you know, Ryan and I are going to be out and about now, now that we're actually teeing it up and we're playing. And I know if you've listened and followed along, you've heard about many of the spots that we're dying to get to and see. Um, and then you also, you know, we saw the numbers and we saw how much participation took place that, you know, when we did our, you know, inaugural March Madness drop podcast edition Seaview Bay won the whole damn thing so we knew that we were ending up at Seaview Bay and it was just fitting that we got to see it the Friday before the ShopRite Classic even began so again big shout out to Jeff Carswell and his crew there for for allowing that allowing us to have that opportunity so obviously Ryan and I will be out and about you guys see us don't be afraid to come over say hello introduce yourselves we'd love to to meet you know, as many of you as we can. Um, but Seaview was like our next stop. You know, I, I know last week we spoke about how we went down to Shoregate. You know, we, we let this week we went out to Seaview, saw the Bay Course. Um, so, you know, it was nice to see the winner of our tournament as well. And I think the one thing that really stood out to me more so than others is, is we have had the opportunity to play there. Um, so we do know what the course looks like and the, and the aesthetics and the views are, are amazing. You know, seeing the Atlantic City skyline in a distance from so many different tees and, and greens um, was really, really cool. 
and I'm sure that you've seen the pictures that you know we put out there over the weekend. But I think the greens are super tricky, um, and you know I think for for a golfer it can be a little frustrating at times knowing how firm they are. And that was a question that I can't lie that when I asked Jeff about it, you know, I was kind of curious to see his take on it because, you know, not being an LPGA pro like, you know, like the women that'll be in there this week, you know, like I kind of was trying to figure out like, what is their perception of that? Are they okay with that? Are they used to that? Um, But, you know, to the golf course defense, that's what kind of holds it up, right? Because I think without it being 6,300 yards, you know, you can see why a lot of them can go so low, but I thought the golf course was in great shape. Like you said, Ry, the maintenance guys were out there grinding. I mean, we would play a hole and someone would be right behind us, whether they were cleaning, you know, the signs, raking the bunkers, trimming the grass, rolling the greens, like they were out there doing work. The Transfusion Cocktail is the golf club classic you know and love. For years, golfers have looked forward to this drink at the turn or in the clubhouse. Now, Lynx Drinks has created a brand of ready-to-drink transfusion vodka canned cocktails. The classic is made with vodka, ginger ale, and grape juice. The front nine with orange juice and the back nine with cranberry juice. All three are 7% ABV, gluten-free, and are made with natural ingredients and no preservatives. Lynx Drinks transfusions are sold in foursome packs at over 3,000 locations and available in 16 states. Just grab it and go for a perfect tasting cocktail every time. On the course, the beach, a boat, or a barbecue at home with family and friends. You can now enjoy this golf tradition anywhere. We think it will become your new favorite cocktail on or off the links. Go, so go check them out at linksdrinks.com or on Instagram at linksdrinks. Yeah, which was, which was really... Again, just just cool behind the scenes things to see. You know, I, I don't, I don't really have like anything deep or, or you know anything about that. But it, it was uh, it was really cool to see. You want to go through our round, Mike? Do yeah. You want to go to next? I, I get. I should have. I should have. Uh, I should have started with the uh, the drop madness and mentioned that. But uh, so thanks for picking that up. But let's let's get into our rounds here. We don't necessarily need to go shop by shop, but you know we got down there, got to see all the setup and the you know we've played both of their played a few times. It was definitely a little different than the last couple times I've played, with kind of the pomp and circumstance that's starting to go on that they had there. But but the check in wasn't all that different. Get over the first tee, like I said, they got the the grandstands up and hitting that first tee shot, getting onto the green, kind of getting underway is a lot of fun, but. I think I think I bogeyed the first hole and was like, okay, let's let's get off and running. And then the next couple holes, I just I got, I, I feel like I was just, I was mentally and physically exhausted because every shot on the front, I feel like, and and I know you you played much better than I did. I don't know if you felt like this. I felt like every shot was like there was never an easy shot. It wasn't like, hey, I'm just gonna just going to hit this. You know, I, I don't have to, doesn't matter where it goes. It's going to land on planet earth and I'm going to be fine. I don't, there's not many of those shots on the front. And, and if you're not hitting it well, you really need to focus and grind. And, and I'm not going to lie. I know I said it to you on, on, uh, on 11. It's like, I, I'm exhausted. I, I don't know if I'm going to go any further. <laughs> and, uh, and it was, it was really tough for me. You know, even like, like on three, I, I shot the pin, a par five kind of got unlucky and I, I clipped a tree branch and it came straight down so I wanted to get a little more aggressive downwind played it short but felt like that was a good distance and I I, I must have hit off the green and lost my ball in like the stuff behind it and I, I just I hit that ball to the number I was going to and just the ball kicked off a hard green and went into the into the fescue, couldn't find it. So even if I felt like I hit a good shot, I was still struggling out there. Yeah, listen, I, I and I think that's one thing we heard Jeff, and again, when the audience gets the interview with Jeff, is he kind of goes on about that. Because I think for golfers like us that don't typically play there, and I'm sure there's audience members that play at CV Bay way, way, way more than we do, that are like, yeah, if you knew that, you might have gone lower, that like, you need to play to the front of the green on all those greens 
that if you think you're going to fly it, pin high, check it, spin it, bring it back, like, no offense, like, those greens are firm. Right, I'm not like, doing that firm. on on a day where they're currently watering the green. I'm not able to have it sit and check. So, like, what makes you think I'm going to have it check on concrete? Yeah, it, yeah, that that was that was the one thing that I think you and I finally got to start saying probably around 14. We're like, dude, we're just playing to the front. Mm -hmm. Like, whatever the front is, like, tell me what it is. And, you know, and I think... You know, for your round specifically, when you look at the front and the back, like, yeah, there's no doubt like you were defeated mentally, physically, emotionally, even emotionally. Yep, mm -hmm. I'm going to say that yeah. after the front nine um, that, you know, I'm not, you know, I, I was sitting there like, oh, my God, you know, this, this, this guy's we're, we're leaving. <laughs> we're leaving. Like we're back in our bags. We're playing nine holes and we're going home. <laughs> like we're calling this early because no doubt, like when you talk about like who won, you know, the front nine of CV Bay won over you. But I think the, the thing about golf, and I think we've said it so many times on the podcast, is it's so damn hard. But it can be such a quirky little sport that all of a sudden the back nine, you're firing, you, you, you throw two birdies in a nine holes and no offense, we talked about it out there, like you probably should have birdied 18 too uh, and I, had three birdies in a nine hole stretch. Yep, but, but uh, and to your point, I definitely, I had a birdie opportunity on 18, but golf is hard. That golf course is hard. I'm not terribly good. I turn a birdie into a bogey. <laughs> but yeah, it is funny how that kind of, again, like there were some shots I felt like I put good swings on them. And, and I don't want to say got unlucky, but like maybe rather than. But you did. But you did. Some, and, right, and no offense. No, some that's I did, part of but, golf. Yeah. Sometimes you get, you hit the ball in the trees and it kicks out to the middle of the fairway. Right. And sometimes it hits the trees and goes OB. Yeah. Like. I mean, you bringing up that third shot on number three where it hits and I'm like, oh, that's a good shot. Yep. Not knowing where the hell it was. And then we just never found the ball. And we looked. Right. Some, and right. we looked. And we looked. Right. The, the maintenance guys, if you're listening to this at Seaview, behind the green on three, <laughs> there's a ball. If you don't want one of the LPGA women to find it, I would go search for it. But otherwise, some, you know. I hope that doesn't – can you imagine, Mike, if that comes into play, like one of the LPGA girls finds it in the back, plays a wrong ball, and it's my ball? <laughs> you know, that caddy's getting fired. That wouldn't be good. Yeah, so I will say, and it doesn't, it doesn't make it any better, but it is a par 37 on the front, and I shot a 49. And then I went back on the back, which is a par 34, and I shot a 37. So – two very different nines and that's with doubling 11 uh, you know three putt on 10 for a bogey doubling 11 and and able to shoot 30 what i say 37 i was 12 shots better is is pretty significantly different so i really like i know i did not play well i always say this i don't play well on the front there i don't know what it is if it's just the long drive down or and no warm up or I just become Charles Barkley out there. I don't know what it is, but I don't think it's that. But I like the back much better. It, the, the back hits my eye a little bit better. I think there's better holes on the back. I, I don't know. Just, just I, I like that stretch from like 12 is a nice hole. I like 13 a lot. But like 13 through 18 are a great stretch of holes. And if you want to throw 12 in there, I'm fine with throwing 12 in there as well. But those holes on the back are really, really good. Whereas on the front, like when I was trying to think about the holes, I lose track of the holes on the front. Like one I know, two I know, three I know. And then I start to lose, like they start to kind of combine. And I'm like, okay, six is where I recorded. So then it's the par three, seven, eight. And then which one's nine? Oh, that's the, that's the gettable par five. Like there's, there's just a couple that like, I don't really remember. I remember every hole on the back and they're more memorable to me. And I don't know what that means, but I, I think that means something that like, Again, I, I like those holes a little better. I like, I like 13. 14 is really cool. You can't see your drive uh, land. You got to go kind of over that berm there. That's, that's there. 15's a, a really, really good par three. Uphill, long. You got the reeds behind you. you know, you're kind of hitting through a chute with Atlantic City in the background. 16's iconic with, with the enormous bunker on the right, which they have a, a fun name for. 
17, the short par three, which is, which as we play, maybe it's ho hum par three, but when you're playing it with enormous grandstands behind it, it's really, really cool. And, and honestly, it gives you, I felt different playing that because you have two bunkers in the front, which are enormous. And then you have the grandstands behind it. You feel like you have to hit it onto like a plateau. Whereas other times you don't necessarily feel like that because it's like, okay, let's just get it over the bunkers. And then 18, such a great hole, finishing hole, par five. Again, with the grandstands there. I don't know. I, I just, I like, I can name every hole on the back and just kind of go through it. Whereas I can't really do that on the front. And even playing it a few times, I can't do that. So I, there's something to that. I don't necessarily know what that means, but there's something there. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I, I think I think if you ask me which side do I like better, I would I would agree that the back is more me memorable. I do. I think, like you said, you can describe the holes. And I think for me, if you ask me like my favorite hole in the front, I love seven. That little par three, you know, if you took a picture from the green back to the tee box, you see, you know, the Atlantic City skyline back there. Like, I think that's a really, really cool par three. And then I also like 15, like you said, the par three on the other side where, you know, it's kind of like in that same teeing area where the backdrop is very similar. But then you got 15s a little longer. It's a little more challenging. Um, so there's no doubt, you know, that the back, I, I would 100% agree, is better than the front. It's more memorable than the front. Um, and the grandstands there on 17 were pure. And then 18 was, was cool too. And I think that just kind of goes back to like when we were playing at Upper Montclair in the Cognizance Media Day. Like, you don't realize how close the grandstands truly are at these events unless you see it firsthand because when you see it on tv you're like oh that's that's there and you think they have room behind it like no like they are legitimately five six seven paces off the green and boom there's this huge huge grandstand right i i also feel like to that point mike i feel like it doesn't do it justice from TV or even when you've been to an event, like how close they are to, to when you're on the course, you know, like, like we're going to watch it on TV and at 17 there, it might not look, or it might look like it's not that close. The grandstands are right on top of you. Same thing with 18. Like you're hitting into this bowl there and you're, I mean, you just trickled off the back on 18 and we're backed up to the, to the, the grandstand. grandstand. So I was right underneath the tower. So and, and I felt like it just trickled off, like watching your ball. So uh, it was just like, like those kind of things to me are, I don't know if they show on TV, which are, again, kind of the cool things in, in this like behind the scenes look that we got there for sure. Yeah, no doubt. And I, I mean, listen, at the end of the day, it was, it was a great, great thing. Um, big kudos to Jeff and his, and his staff for getting us out there, you know, and, and we've been saying it over and over again. You know, we're going to be out and about. We're, we're checking the boxes to the places that we've been talking about all winter long about where we want to get to. And after CV Bay won, our March Madness pool was a no-brainer. We were going there. Like, it, it may not have been high on where we wanted to play because we both have played there. But when you win the whole damn thing, you know, we're packing our bags and we're coming. And, and we were, we did it. Yeah, for sure. All County Exteriors is a third generation premier exterior home remodeling company celebrating over 40 years in business in a remodeling world where the average remodeling company only survives in business for only five years. All County Exteriors has stood the test of time, providing their customers with top quality roofing, siding, windows and doors. They service homeowners and builders with anything from small repairs to large additions. All County Exteriors is not just limited to construction. They have a deep passion for giving back to their community and are charitable supporters of the Make-A-Wish Foundation, the American Cancer Society, Roofs for Troops, and Parents of Autistic Children. If you had planned to do any exterior remodeling, call the experts at All County Exteriors for a free, no obligation estimate for your project. Just call 732-370-2780 or email them at info at allcountyonline.com. That's 732-370-2780 for all at County Exteriors for all your remodeling needs. All right, so for today's from the grandstand question, 
It's an interesting topic. It's one that, you know, you and I really haven't spoken much about, but I f feel like in the last, you know, seven to 10 days, this has been a very, very hot topic um, in the world of golf. And today's question from the grandstand comes from Chris in Monmouth County. And his question says, will live last or do you guys think it will eventually fade away? What's your take on that one? Chris in Monmouth County. That's my county. Chris, I, I, I think that's a great question. With where Liv has come to, I, I do think I've gotten to a point. I, I was, I was anti-Liv to start, and I still would not be on the Liv. Like, if I was a PGA Tour pro, I, I still don't – I wouldn't go to Liv. But I think now that the dust has kind of settled a bit, I think Liv has a place – on tour or or in the world and i think that there's something to that there's something to whatever whatever live has has kind of gone to i think that there's a spot here for them um i think there's still work to be done i i, I would i'm interested to see what happens with the world golf rankings because i think that's important i think that they don't play them not playing 72 holes matters um but clearly, with clearly you got guys on tour there that can play. You know, with Brooks and DJ, guys that have proven themselves before. I think there's kinks that need to be worked out. But I, I do. While I'm not supportive of Live, I think that there's a place for them. You know, in in the in the world of golf, I do. Kind you know, just like there's, I still think the PGA Tour would be king. Just like it's it's king over. Like there's a European tour that we never talk about that players are playing on European tour events. So why has this one been so controversial? Well, you know, we know where the money's coming from. We know that they're stealing guys to have them only be there. Like there's, there's that, there's the lawsuits, which, you know, again, I don't love those, those as well. But like, again, I think as like an underling kind of tour, I think it has a spot in, in the world of golf, again, with things to figure out. Yeah, listen, it, I, and I think it's it's such a great question, mainly because of how active Phil has been on Twitter recently. And I know that him and Brandel have been going back and forth about this and that, and Brandel's trying to set up meetings, and Phil's saying he's not he hasn't contacted him at all. And you know, and I think to Liv's credit, listen, their players are playing really good, and it's hard to deny that. And I think that's one thing we all knew is like. They stole dudes. It wasn't just like run-of-the-mill guys that are journeymen. Like, they have big-time players, and I think what Brooks did at Oak Hill and the PGA is evidence. Like, the dude golfed his ball. Right. Masters as well. And played well. Yeah. And the Masters. You got you had Phil and Brooks right there. So, it's a very, very touchy, tough conversation, and... You know, I know a lot of people may say, like, well, where, where the money's coming from and it's sports washing. And listen, there's no doubt that all that is is really what's going on. Um, but in terms of, like, is it bad? Is it good? Like, you know, it's really up to for you to make your own decision about that. But I do think that to some extent, like, there's got to be a way to work it out to where it's not just, like, good and bad per se um like because the Ryder cup's coming up right and i know that's another huge topic with live are they going to play or they're not going to play and then rory says he doesn't want anybody playing and then rory now changes it that brooks should play now for the american team because he's in right. but he doesn't want any of the european guys and then rom comes out and says i want the best 12 yeah and it's a tough tough thing because we all make decisions in life sometimes that are what's best for us and our family. And I think the way a guy like Harold Varner handled it and saying like, listen, I'm doing this for my family. Generational it's gonna better wealth. them off for generational wealth. Exactly. It's hard to argue that. Who am I to tell Harold Varner what's the right thing to do? Right. Do Would I do it? No. But then again, I'm not in Harold Varner's shoes. Right. So it's, it's a tough thing. And yes, I think it's going to last if you're going to ask me like yes or no. And I do think it's going to be around and they're going to have to find a way to coexist. Yeah.
I, I also think that it's been as much as we gave Phil, a, a, you know, we gave, how many people gave Phil shit for all of the stuff that he was like, hey, we have to change. All the changes have been good in the PGA Tour. The, the designated events, the higher purses, the having guys have mandatory, like you got to play at X number of events. There's there's been certain things that have been good for the PGA Tour that they've that they've changed post that you know that Tiger and Rory big players meeting that they had. There's been a lot of good changes that have come from Phil's you know insolence or or whatever you want to call it, like whatever his whatever his starting this has been. There's been a lot of good changes and and hopefully some more to come. And then even. Another one is like playing players. Like you play in an event, you're getting paid no matter what. Even if you don't make the cut, you're getting five grand. Because those guys that are grinding on tour, like that at least pays for their travel. You know, it was at least free for them to get there and have it have a, a shot. You know, so there, there's been a lot of good changes <clears throat> on on even the PGA side that have needed to happen. So uh, again, like it's not for me. But good things have come out of it, and and like I said, I think there's a place for it in the golf world, with still ironing things out. As I yeah, said. and listen, and sometimes sometimes competition is never a bad thing. Right. And yeah. I think ultimately, like the PGA Tour saw that and said, like, oh, we better start making some serious changes, and you know, kind of you know, shit or get off the pot type to, type of deal, and they did, and no doubt the changes have been phenomenal. But it's unfortunate the changes came about because of this. Right. And, and again, like the lawsuit that happened and all that kind of stuff. So we see a better product for it, which is, which is good. All right. So that's going to wrap up our, uh, our episode today. Um, we're going to send you now to our interview with Jeff Carswell, head pro at Seaview Golf Club. Seaview is the host of the ShopRite Cup this week. Uh, you can tune into it. And, and give it a watch. Mike and I are going to be glued to it to, because, you know, we just played it. So we're, we're excited to see the, the women play the course. So, so here's our interview with Jeff. Enjoy. Since the game began, golfers have longed to spend eternity on the golf course. Extraholes.com has made that possible. Extraholes.com is a unique way to pay tribute to a golfer who has selected cremation upon their death. Their biodegradable, personalized golf balls have been designed as a creative option for family members and friends to celebrate and remember the life of a golfer. Extra Holes golf balls, respectfully hand-filled with a sample of a golfer's cremated ashes, when struck off a tee will burst into small pieces, releasing the ashes to float in the air and settle softly on the ground. Honor a family member or friend who loved golf or ensure that your family or friends will help spread your ashes on a golf course you enjoyed playing during your life. Get the details and full story by visiting extraholes.com. That's extraholes.com. So today's guest is the head golf professional down at Seaview Golf Club. Jeff Carswell, thank you so much for giving us some of your time. I know how hectic things are with, you know, the Shoprite Classic coming in there next week. So, um, thank you very much for stop on, uh, coming on here real quick with us. No problem. Happy to do it. Thanks for having me, guys. For sure. Yeah, Jeff. Thanks for coming on. I, I think I think this was one of the episodes that we, you know, way back when in March, and we saw Sea View Golf Club, specifically the Bays Course making its rounds, you know, through our March Madness pool. And just honestly, you know, your people turned out so well, just kept winning and winning. And, and Ryan and I said, like, whoever ends up winning this bad boy is, you know, we're going to venture our way down. And, you know, you gave us a perfect opportunity to come down right before the LPGA tournament comes there. We got to see all the grandstands set up. We got to see the golf course firsthand. Um, so it, it was, it was a really, really cool experience. So I, I want to make sure that, you know, we thank you, you know, tremendously for all that. No problem. Any, anytime. Glad you guys, uh, glad you enjoyed it. It was, uh, it was pretty neat to see that in the March Madness bracket. That was a cool idea. And, uh, I was glad to see everybody kind of show up and we had some, uh, good member participation sharing the, uh, the posts and everything, which got some extra eyeballs on it, which was great. So it was, it was neat to see. 
it was it really got popular and and I was I didn't know and and Jeff I know we've talked about like the membership there I had no idea like how many me- like how member driven it was I, I thought it was more resort and public but but really it's it's got a ton of members there so yeah they definitely showed out yeah. we got a, yeah we got a pretty active membership so we we cap the number each year just because we do a lot of outside events and with the resort aspect to it but the membership here is pretty active and plays plays a lot of golf and seeing the grandstands with people in them is much different than seeing them empty like we did. It was really a, a neat experience. So like like Mike said, that was perfectly timed. And that was, that, again, just really cool to see. It was a really cool experience. Yeah, it's always fun to go out there and knock it around a little bit with those up, kind of give you the walk up 18th fairway vibe and everything. Yeah. Jeff, you, you've been a uh, you know, head pro at Seaview now for a couple of years. You were at Colts Neck before that. Um, and, and kind of been around. I know you're at Matita Conk and Eagle Ridge as well. What about Seaview was so appealing to to be the head job for you down there? So I, yeah, I was I, yeah, I was fortunate. I've worked at uh, you know a bunch of different clubs. I've seen kind of what I like to think is every every angle of the business. I've worked at uh, two semi private clubs, um, high end private club. Now I'm at a you know high end resort uh, you know golf club now. Um, Seaview is just great. I mean, it's, you get something different every day. It's, uh, it's very active. We have a lot of outside group play. I like to stay busy. Um, so with that, you know, 36 holes, active pro shop here. We do a lot of sales in the shop here. Um, great golf courses. I love the history of Seaview, uh, and what it has, you know, dating back to 1914, I think is really cool. Um, I also played a lot of junior golf here growing up. So it's kind of cool to come full circle uh, and come back as a golf pro now. You know, so, and then for me too, it's, I'm a big family guy. So <laughs> CBU is uh, much closer to home for me, which is a, is a nice commute, but then also keeps me nearby, um, you know, near, nearby the family. So it's been, it's been a great change of pace. So I'm loving it here. That's great. Going from, from Colt Snack, which is where I met you, you know, we, we worked there together. I, I uh, I, I'm really happy to see you at Seaview, as I know I've told you before. That's the commute you had to the commute you have now. Even just that has got to be life-changingly uh, different for you. So I'm, I'm really happy you're there. And, and honestly, again, knowing you for, for a while now, I don't, I don't think I realize that you played a bunch of junior events there. And I really love that. That hallmark aspect of coming full circle for you, I think, is really cool. Let can we talk a little bit about the Bay Course specifically? Yeah. I mean, I think from from an audience perspective, and and I know a lot of questions that we get asked are like, what do you think of that place? You know, give us some pros and cons. But I think the one thing specifically, you know, being fortunate enough to play the Bay Course multiple times. Like the views there are really, really something. And, you know, I, I understand, you know, it may not be the longest of all the golf courses in the area or, you know, maybe even on the LPGA Tour in terms of what they typically would play. But I think the greens there can be, you know, the pins could be in super tough spots, which negates, I think, the length from a lot of, in a lot of ways. You know, like, and then you add the views on top of that, like, why don't you talk a little bit about the Bay Course specifically? Because I'm sure that's probably, again, I'm assuming, but I'm assuming it's like one of the, it's talked about way more and more highly of than the Pines. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, that's a, that's definitely a fair statement. You know, it gets a lot of eyeballs on it with the LPGA coming up here. Um, the Pines Golf Course is fantastic. It's a great layout. It's much longer. Um, but I do think the the views from the Bay Golf Course kind of overtake a lot. You know, I, I agree. It's the, the green complex is there. It's an old golf course, you know, 1914 Donald Ross golf course. Um, it, to me, it's a second shot golf course. You know, it's pretty fair off the tee, but depending on where those pins are placed and what the winds blow in that day, they are tiny greens and they get, they can get pretty firm. And it's uh it's a definite good test of golf there. Um, I don't know the exact stats, but I, I have heard that um, it is, one of the shortest golf courses that the LPGA plays, but it typically falls on one of the higher scoring sides that they play. And I, to me, that's, you know, that's just this, it's the second shots, you know, those pins, there's a couple of them. I don't know which ones you guys saw when you're out there, but there's a few locations there, you know, front left and number eight, you're looking at that card on the scorecard uh, or that hole on the scorecard. It's a, it's a short par four, but if that pin is front left, you know, it's in, 
it's pretty much impossible to get near that pin. You know, you're coming back up the hill, back towards it. Um, there's there's some really good ones there that that protect it and kind of kind of avoid that. You know, looking at the card and seeing, oh, it's a 6,300 yard golf course. I'm going to go out there and go light it up. It holds its own. It holds its own. You know, against the best in the world, and we're going to see some coming up this week. Yeah, I'm I'm well aware of how uh, of how it holds its own uh, as I got as I got absolutely destroyed on the front. Um, yeah. But the the pin was front left on on eight when we played, Mike. Yeah. That thing on that on that hill there, right by that slope, you don't have a full swing. I mean, because you want to hit it up close to the green or try and drive the green, but then you can't get any spin on it to hold it anywhere near that pin. No. Yeah, that, that's exactly what we did. We both hit it right next to the front right bunker and legit still had 20 footers for birdie coming back. How about back. number nine? You get number nine, you know, the same thing. Another uh, kind of short, gettable par five, but they put the pin on the right side there. That's a tough one to get to. That thing bends a lot away from you to the back edge of the green and – and if you miss that thing short right, that's a tough up and down from there. Mike had a 12-foot eagle putt. Yep. And then he had a 10-foot birdie putt. <laughs> Sounds about right. Yep. Sounds like you guys had some good pins when you came up. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> wish I got out and, there for you. Yep. And no offense, and I'll give you another one. Let's just keep going. Let's go to number 10. Yeah. Number 10, that, that pin was green. as yep. front. It was as front of the green uh, as you possibly could right, put I mean, it. I it was practically how... off the green and in the bunker. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So you weren't getting it close yep, to there. That's one of my favorite. I like that little green complex there, bunker front. You know, you get the pins tucked up front there. It's a that's a cool little hole. They, they really, Jeff, you, you said it. The greens are the protection, but like that, like that hole specifically, that bunker that's in front is it's like it's not a dog leg because it's it's rather straight, it's but like, yeah. but it's you can't go near the bunker because if you're in the bunker. You're not getting it on the green into, so you got to avoid it. You got to stay short of it, or you got to go right of it, and then, and then really, it's like a, a left turn kind of. But yep. again, I don't know if I'd call it a dog leg because it's only like from there, it's only like a forty-five yard dog leg. So it's not like it's a yep. real, but like it's those kind of things that make that protect the course. And like you said, the green complex and the the strategically placed bunkers that are holding up even from nineteen fourteen are. Uh, our... I'll tell you one thing. One, uh, we do a fun little event towards the end of the year, our uh, Hickory Classic, and we get the members out there. They dress up. You know, I give them a couple extra strokes on the card if they uh, dress in the the 19-era knickers or anything like that. And we get wooden hickory shafted clubs, feathered golf balls from a company in Chicago that ships them out to us. And uh, that golf hole is completely different with those clubs. You're trying because your driver's not getting down there where you got a little 70-yard wedge into it. Now you're hitting a mashy from, uh, you know, 140 trying to get it to kind of bend and curve it up in between the bunker instead of going up and over it. It's a, it's a very different golf hole. <laughs> so, so it's funny how, again, I think that goes to show Donald Ross's brilliance and his – that things that he put in place way back 100-plus years ago are still holding true even with how different golf is today. Yeah, Absolutely. And then uh, the one thing I will say, you know, like about the golf course, is it fair to say heading into, I guess, you know, next week or what will be this week for the the ladies when they come down, will the greens be faster than what Ryan and I saw this past week? Yeah, so typically we – our greens we typically have over there um, – I guess when you guys played them, they were probably around – just shy of 11, um, you know, or right around that, the LPGA comes in and they kind of set a lot of the speeds and the, the rough heights and the fairway cut heights that they want to see them at. Uh, and so they they want to see them typically around an 11, 11 and a half. Um, a lot of that is because of, you know, I think my personal opinion is just, you know, the size of the greens, they're tiny um, with how firm they get. Uh, we do have a lot of slope in them. So if you start kicking them up more than that 11 and a half on those tiny greens, it's, you know, could get away from you and could get a little unfair if you're going quicker than that. So they'll, they'll, they'll be a little quicker than what you guys typically, what you guys saw, but, but should be pretty close to that. Yeah, they were definitely firm. I, I mean, that I, I will say again, like I know that's probably like you, you've mentioned here is that is like the defense of the length of the courses. Yep. Those greens were firm because there was a couple of times – you know, I'd hit a lob wedge into a green and it would bounce pin high, like as high yep. off the green. And I'm like, holy hell. Um, but again, that's that's part of 
the defense of the golf course. Like, you yep. know, like some, I'm sure there's, there's different ways to play and smarter ways than how I play it. So, yeah, I mean, I, um, I tell a lot of people when we go out for playing lessons or anything or course management stuff out there, like the bay golf, particularly big golf course, you know, play to the front edge of the green, shoot, whatever the front of the green is. Cause the ball is going to take a first big hop and the greens are so tiny that no matter where the pin is, you're going to have a 15 or 20 foot putt from there. If you hit the front edge, it'll end up in the middle of the green somewhere. So once you start trying to fire at something, especially like number two or six, when you got those big, you know, the the second tiers on the back edges of the green, you try to land it on that, you're bouncing into the marsh. Okay. Well, now you tell me. I've played it only a, yeah, you know, yeah. a well, handful I of times. You, I wanted <laughs> you to struggle a little bit, you know. <laughs> two, I lost my ball because I went – I went at the. I had the. I had the pin. I shot it. I had one nineteen. We were with the wind. I said, "All right, that's my like. Let me just play my one ten club." And I, what hole I, is that? I number two. Number two. Yeah. And I'm still that's looking for the four. ball. That's a par four on the scorecard, but it's a par five in your head. You know, you get out of there with a bogey, you're 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 saving a stroke there. That's a tough call for. Jeff, let me tell you real quick. We played nine hole. The front nine. Okay. I thought. I and and I've seen Ryan. You know. For now, what however long we've been doing is six months, like every week, and and I've seen the anger come out sometimes, and like you yeah. know snippy comments, and I'm like, all right, I'll I'll stop poking the bear a little bit here, <laughs> but I sometimes. saw it, I saw it firsthand in person after he fired a I'm not even gonna sugarcoat this a miserable 49 on the front nine, okay, yeah. I legitimately thought that I was getting in my car and we were going home. Yeah, I was. Slam it he, out of there. Yeah, I hate this place. I never play well at this place. I've lost three golf balls already. My man was so miserable. I literally said golf, as I'm the walking through the, as I'm walking like stomping through the reeds like behind one of the holes as I'm looking for my golf ball. Mike, I think I'm out of here. I think I'm done. <laughs> eleven. You were you hit it on eleven on the par three. Oh yeah, you hit yeah, it yeah. right into right over the bunker. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And and good thing I didn't because I played I played twelve through eighteen even maybe. There you go. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, like I Jeff, know, when I it don't know if it's if it's a layout or me personally, like I I'm very similar in that where if I feel like I can get by the front nine and you know right around even or a couple over that you could put up a good number on the back. I always just seem to score a little bit better on the back. Yeah. Yeah. I think if I think if you're driving it well. You, you have chances because like you said, like it is on the shorter side. And I know that second shot is, is important, but I always felt like if I could place the ball in an, in a spot where I knew I had a chance to knock it somewhere near the green, like if you're, if your putter's hot, like I can see some of those ladies, like really, you know, I, I don't know what the number is in terms of that tournament, what they shoot, but like, I'm guessing like 65s are like not even a question. Uh, Brooke shot 64 in the last round last year. Yep, yep. Uh, yeah, so, so I, I, I shot, could see I them she doing shot that. 60, 68, 69, 64, something like that. But yeah, had a had a great Sunday. Right, but like you said, the, you're no as long as you hit it to the front of the green and let it let it trickle on or just be on the green, you're you're usually not going to have more than a 15, 20 footer. And and as Mike said, if the putter's hot and you make a couple of those. You, oh, you yeah. got, yep. you know, you got yourself a round going on. Yep. Still waiting for that putter to get hot. You got to get that putter hot for sure. Yeah. Uh, Jeff, I, I want to get into the ShopRite Classic here for a second. Like as the as the head pro, and you mentioned like the the LPGA coming in. What is your role in in this takeover of the golf course? Like, what are you are you given some advice, or do they just say like, hey, sit back and organize the shop? Like, what's the what is your what's your role in this takeover? I mean, in all, in all honesty, the, the ShopRite Classic here you now has been here for, for quite a while. It's kind of a plug-and-play type of an event here. Um, you know, as, and as far as the golf course, Mike and his team, our superintendent, uh, you know, do a great job of getting the place ready to go. There's not a lot you can do to the golf course to kind of to trick it up or do anything differently that way. Um, so myself and our staff, obviously, there's a lot of, of prep leading into it. You know, but as far as once the tournament gets started, you know, we are very active in the pro-ams. You know, that's kind of our our Super Bowl, our big time. You know, it's the largest pro-am in all of golf. Uh, uh, PGA Tour, LPGA Tour, Champions Tour. It's a two-day event. We use the Bay, the Pines, and the Galloway and Galloway for them. So it's a it's a lot of people, a lot of bodies on property. Um, so just logistically, it's it's 
controlling the traffic flow, the amount of people that are there, making sure everybody's staying safe. Uh, but the LPGA comes in with their own team and, and we're kind of here for support, you know, from there once they kind of take over and the tournament goes on. So once the tournament commences, we are running the merchandise tent and then, uh, you know, kind of just there as support if they need us to jump in anywhere and kind of help out and lend a helping hand. So. I didn't know that. That's a that's a huge event for a program using three different tracks. I mean, that's yeah. It's it's a lot of golf. It's uh, you know we do a double tee on the bay, uh, a little bit of a break, and then uh, the double tee picks up up again. The Pines and Galloway just go right off of uh, number one tee from I think it's seven seven thirty in the morning till about one, just straight tee times, and then they we do it again on uh, Thursday. So it's it's a lot. Yep. So that's wild. Yeah, that is crazy. Do a lot of the do the, a lot of the LPGA players stay right there in the resort, or are they traveling down to Atlantic City, or do they? they you know, do you uh, tip so the Shoprite has partnered with Hard Rock Casino, so a majority of them, I believe, you know, they kind of stay in Hard Rock a little bit. They stay, um, some of them stay in the villas. They kind of spread out. There's not, you know, most of the the hotel here is guests or people working with the LPGA that's that are in town for the week. Um, and then the players kind of have their own areas, you know, off property. So are you saying that Brooke Henderson's going to be in the hard rock next weekend? Uh, I'm not, not saying that. I don't know. I'm just, I just, <laughs> I'm not sure. I, I think, I think if she was there, I could have a little meet cute moment with her. I think that would be, there you uh... go. Yep, yep. <laughs> please, please record that. <laughs> <laughs> Equity3 Real Estate is a full-service commercial real estate brokerage, management, and development company based out of Paramus, New Jersey. Equity3 Real Estate focuses heavily in northern New Jersey. They cover industrial, multifamily, office, retail, and vacant land properties, as well as specializing in medical offices. They manage over 400,000 square feet of varying property types for passive investors. Their clients range from small to mid-range building owners and larger brokerages. So if you're looking for the right team to help you win, go check them out at www.equity3re.com or give them a call at 201-261-4300. That's 201-261-4300. You will not be disappointed. I'm very, the whole thing just intrigues me. You know, I think one of the things that, you know, Ron and I have, have seen now in this short amount of time of doing this is getting invited to these events and, and meeting different people and seeing different things like, you know, it's just eye opening. And I, and I think being offered the opportunity like you did, Jeff, to have us come there to play it with the grandstands, you know, I'm sure that the week is going to be a phenomenal week for you guys. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm excited to, to watch. And I think the one thing that we speak about a lot is watching the golf course on TV and then being able to relate to it because you just played it. I think that's a huge thing. And I think that's, you know, a really cool thing when, when the golf course is, is right here in, in New Jersey. Absolutely. I know our members love it. You know, it is, it's cool. You know, it's, uh, it's neat to see, you know, to see a pro in a spot that you've been at hundred times and how they're going to go out about playing that shot and how they typically execute it a little bit better than I would, you know, and, uh, but, you know, I know the members love seeing that they'll, they'll typically like to play some golf on the Pines golf course before beforehand. And then they'll walk across the street and watch the event. And that you hear that all week, you know, I hit the ball over there. I, I, I hit it closer from there. You know, it's that's their, their claim to fame, you know, um, but it is, it's definitely cool to see on TV and, and kind of know, how a putt's going to break or have a good idea on what's going to happen there. You know, it's, it's definitely fun. Did you just say they, they play the Pines? So, like, the Pines is open next week for the members? Yeah, so, yeah we're, we are open. The Pines golf course is just closed on um, Wednesday and Thursday during the Pro-Ams. But okay. Monday, Monday, Tuesday, Friday through Sunday, that golf course is open. You know, <laughs> we'll have – we'll have like I said, we are a busy golf course. You know, we'll have 100 and – 180 players go out on that side. That's crazy. Yeah, so it's... So 180 players will go out on, like, Friday round one yeah, of the tournament I mean, if, if, on the other side? If the weather's good, we will be busy over there. Yep. Oh, yep. my God. That's yeah. insane to me. 
10 minute tea time interval starting at 6 30 in the morning and uh and it'll be busy yep. oh my gosh where do they do they hit the range like are they on the range next no, to the so lpga once, players like what's as that of today as of today uh sunday all practice facilities here are closed so it's it's tour only the the putting green has the gate around it with all the sponsorships and stuff range is closed so we send out daily tea time reminders just hey when you come on property, you must, the, the biggest logistics here is the parking from it. Um, Cause like I said, it's a lot of bodies on the property. So we try to get people to, to come carpool type of deal. Um, the only way that you're parking on property is if you have a tee time for that day or you have a special LPGA parking pass, depending on which lot you're with. But the, the golfers have to use the bag drop. We'll give them a daily parking pass. And then they park in one of our lots um, behind the hotel. Gotcha. But as far as warm up and stuff like that, like men's locker room is taken over by the LPGA now. They, that's all the locker rooms for them. Um, you know, driving range closed, putting greens closed. So it's just, you know, take a breakfast ball on the first tee if you need it. If your group's okay with that, I guess. If not, just stretch out pretty well and play hard. Wow. Yeah, that's a busy weekend. Yeah. It is a busy weekend. Yeah. Let me ask you, Jeff. Uh, uh, since you just mentioned. What's the course record on the Pines? You know what? I'm going to be complete. I, I don't know. Okay. I'm still, uh, still pretty new here, but I don't know exactly what that number is. And that and that's okay because it doesn't need to. Let's say it's 63. Yep. And someone shoots a 62 with a breakfast ball next Friday. Yep. No, I'm not good. Not okay with that. Not okay with it. Not Me, okay neither. They're not, Me neither. They're gonna make a, Me they're neither. They're going to make a par or something or birdie on that second ball. But if that first ball is in the trees and next to the villas, not, they're not doing that. I'm not okay with that. Okay. I I back that. I back that really a actually, thousand percent. I know uh, Mike's very familiar with uh, with Eagle Ridge and stuff. I've heard. I, I know of a story there where the. I don't know if it's still the course record, but I know it was an unofficial sixty-two there, where uh, one of the members was playing with. I think it was like his brother-in-law or something like that, and member hits the putt up to about a foot away. It would have been a kick in for sixty-two, and the brother-in-law swatted the ball back to him and gave it to him, and then so. This particular member does not count that as his course record, but it was a foot away. Guy's going to make the putt, but it didn't hit the bottom of the cup. I, Jeff, I I back I back both of those yeah. because to me, like when you're talking about records and you're talking about like all time things, like I hate to be that in a sense. It could be like that old guy in the room, yeah. like get off my lawn. But the reality is, but yeah, but when it the reality is, I'm setting a record. Yeah. Like, no offense, I don't care if it's a six-inch or the ball's on the lip. Like, that damn thing needs to touch the bottom of the cup for something to be record-setting. Yeah, no, I agree with that, too. Like, when it comes to a record, I, I think I heard most of that. It's It does a disservice to the score that was done before it. You know, and if uh, and let's talk about Seaview here. You know, you have a, a PGA championship that Sam Snead won, you know, chipping in to win an event, you know, and then you're going to say a guy shot 63 here, but – yeah, I hit an extra shot here and there. It's not, it's not the same. You can't, you know, it does a disservice to the history at the place. I think it's, I think it's also a slippery slope. Like you hit a breakfast ball and then you play everything bottom of the cup after that. It's like, okay, maybe like, okay, one group does that. And then in the next group pushes the envelope a little bit more. And the next group pushes the envelope a little bit more and more and more. And it's, yeah, yeah. It's a, yep. a slippery slope there, for sure. So I, I guess I'll, I'll ask my end question because I think, you know, you're you're a New Jersey guy and, and you, you've been around the block and obviously you've played a lot of junior events here as well. Give our audience a, a favorite public golf course that you've played growing up and a favorite private golf course. And unfortunately, Seaview is out both your courses there. Got it. Okay. Well, yeah, that would have been, that probably would have been my first go-to, of course. Uh, public golf course, listen, it's not, you know, I grew up playing a municipal golf course. I grew up playing Bailey golf course. You know, I, uh, would not be playing golf if it wasn't for that place. You know, my mom worked up the road and as a junior golfer, it was $7 for me to go there and play all day. I played a lot of other sports, had some shoulder injuries and, and kind of golf got me active again and involved. So I would play 54 holes there a day while, while my mom was at work. So that would definitely be my, my public golf course. I mean, I played golf, really? learned, played golf there with my dad, just yeah. purely from purely from a memory thing. Like the know? nostalgic, the nostalgic. Yeah, part absolutely. Of it. Yep. I mean, it, listen, there's there is a ton of public golf courses. You know, there's you could Bally Owens are great, Seaview's fantastic, Twisted Dunes is probably 
up there for me. I love that link style golf course. You know, there's a lot of really good public tracks, but just from memory nostalgia, you know, type of deal that that would probably be up there for me. Cause again, uh, that place wasn't there. My family, we couldn't afford a country club membership or anything anywhere else. I wouldn't be playing golf if it wasn't for that golf course. So, so a lot of good memories there. The private side of it. Um, I would say it is union league national for me, um, played there last summer. Uh, and that place is spectacular. And again, played junior golf there while it was Sand Barons and then coming back to play as Union League and trying to understand that that's the same property when it looks nothing like it was is absolutely incredible. If you have a chance to play that one, that is an absolute for me, drop everything you're doing and, and go and tee it. Okay. It's, it's funny you say that one because way back when, when we interviewed Chris Goddard up, that was his that was his place that he wants to go play. Yeah. Like he says yeah. he hasn't played it yet and he had said like, Oh God, by the way, that new one down in South Jersey Union League, he's yeah. like, I need to go find a way to play there next time I'm in town. Yeah, I haven't played all three nines. I, I, I don't remember the two that I, I think I played Sherman and I forget the other one. Um but it's just incredible. I mean that, that place is is special, you know. And uh and for me, like that's a uh, visual guy, I think that's why I like the Bay Golf Course a lot. You know the views that are there. Like when you're walk when you're walking that golf course, the views there are spectacular. You know you, it's hard to believe that that's a South Jersey type of golf course there. The amount of soil that they move and the elevation changes that they have there and stuff, it's it's pretty cool. I would certainly love to get on there as well. That, that's on my list. Jeff, how about how about this? How about this? We you get you and God are up versus me and Mike. Done. Pros. Perfect. Pros versus Set the drop. Up. There we go. Set it up. Set <laughs> pros versus the Joes. Yeah, <laughs> pros versus the Joes. <laughs> uh, I also like what you said about Bay Lee. I think it just it's telling how some of our people ask or answer that question because, like, you put more on the nostalgia part of it, whereas other people are putting more on like how they played at a place, and other people are putting more on like the the golf course like architecture. It's it's always it always gives a little bit of insight. So that's that's really cool. Sure. Um, yep, you know, one of those things I'll get asked, you know, we get asked questions all the time of, you know, what's your favorite round of golf or whatever, you know, um, mine's always a, a bit of an oddball one also where, uh, there's this place in Wisconsin, Ryan, you might be familiar with, uh, it's, uh Green Bay, you know, mm -hmm. I don't know, as a Chicago Bear fan, you know, <laughs> um, but my dad and I went out to a Green Bay game and we played a place called the Bog, which is an Arnold Palmer golf course out that way. And that to me, same thing. Was it the best golf course I ever played? No, but it was, I was out there on a football trip, watching the Packers with my dad, playing a good golf course, weather was perfect. It was just, that was one of the most enjoyable days on the golf course. Weather was perfect. Negative 10 and snow. No, it was October. It was, we were beginning of October. <laughs> we scraped ice off of our car in the morning. And by the back nine, it was like, it was close to seven. It was, it was insane. <laughs> Um, all right, Jeff, I got two questions that I end with, and, and um, I think both of them are rather quick, but I, I think, as again, as a New Jersey guy, one of them is super important. You play a little competitive golf, I would say, and, and at, least, um, at least you're playing a, a bunch of golf being a pro. What are some superstitions that you have or habits or or whatever you want to call them before you tee it up that you need to do, whether it's, you know, having two tees in your pocket or the glove in the left pocket or like, what are, what are some things that you do there as far as like, again, superstitions before you tee it up? Um, I don't have anything crazy. I mean, I guess I, I am a, a three T guy three, uh, for three whatever tea? reason. Yeah. I put three T's in my pocket. I don't know why. Um, and then I also have a ball marker that, um, I got for Father's Day from my kids that says kick putt stad um, that I mark all my golf balls with. Oh, I like that. So that's, those are my kind of, I had to make sure I got, got that in my pocket and three golf tees and then we go from there. Nice. Yeah. Pretty simple. Not, yep. not Nothing a lot crazy. there. Nothing crazy. Um, and then the, the last one, again, there's, we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about this. There's a great, a great debate in New Jersey over a particular type of breakfast meat. It's what? pork roll. Had a boy. It's pork roll. Yeah, it's pork roll. Yeah, yeah. So I, I told love, love how I love how he's just straight, definitive to the point. There's, there's that, no I mean, other question. We don't get, we don't need the run around. <laughs> don't need the run around. I think that question's starting to get around. I think he knew it, yep. but uh, yeah, yeah. I, I knew, I knew you were as well. Again, ordering breakfast with you at times, and then also as a as where you are from, I, I knew you're a pork roll guy. 
Um, well, Jeff, thanks so much for coming on. This was really great. I, I appreciate you taking some time out of your super busy schedule, setting up for the uh, Shoprite Classic. It really means a lot. Missed you out there the other day, but but again, thank you for having us and and thank you for spending some time with us here. No problem. Glad to do it. Glad you guys got out there, got to tee it before the event. Uh, you know, again, hope you enjoyed yourself and uh, appreciate you guys having me. Wish you guys nothing but the best. Thanks, bud. Thanks, Jeff. Appreciate it. Talk no to problem. you soon. Take care, guys. Thanks. Bye. Bye. 